वेलकम टू ईपीजी पाठशाला आई एम सुचंद्रा घोष प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एंशंट इंडियन हिस्ट्री एंड कल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कैलकाटा द सब्जेक्ट इज इंडियन कल्चर द थीम इज सोशल एंड कल्चरल हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडिया एंड आई विल बी टॉकिंग टूडे ऑन एम्यूजमेंट्स एंड फेस्टिवल्स इन अर्ली इंडिया नाउ वाई डू वी हैव टू लर्न अबाउट एम्यूजमेंट्स एंड फेस्टिवल्स that is to understand the daily life of the people in early india one must know about the kind of amusements and sports and festivals that were a part of their life we can also see the continuity and change in the nature of these amusements and festivals because some of these amusements and festivals continue in our life till today amusement and festivals form a part of the life of an average indian person life of an ideal urban man had moments of amusements and leisure which included music sports cultural and intellectual pursuits and periodic social get togethers in the form of picnics the common folk must have had their own share of amusements at as well actually this form a part of the daily life everyday life had a structure and in this structure of everyday life we find that each day the is routine and beyond the routine there are some days where we have some kind of seasonal festivals and therefore the annual cycle of festivals and periodic fairs provide the rhythm of collective life to understand this rhythm of collective life there are certain sources and we find that every indian had its share of amusements and sports and pastimes even in the past most of the amusements were provided by professional entertainers like we have nutters the actors and those who practically uh wanted to explore or project their cultural traits also became a part of the amusement functionary so there were some people who practiced highly developed arts such as drama music and dancing and so they entertained people by that in the villages sometimes it was different we read of musicians birds acrobats jugglers magicians etc who were sources of entertainment the prevalence of games and sports in india from a very early period is indicated by the bandhogor inscription of 165 ce actually this bandhogor inscription talks about a merchant pusha and this is the inscription of a merchant where we find that he writes about a vyama shala so this vyama shala was located in the forest tract of bandhagar in the caves so naturally the merchants who moved from these places stayed in bandhagar which was a halting station and therefore they must have practiced this kind of activities gymnastic activities now let us move to games as a source of amusement and pastime in early india and see from when we know about these the digha nikaya indicated that india had a rich and diverse culture of games and sports from a very early period in fact the buddha while explaining to king ajata shatru how a perfect buddha refrains from all earthly indulgences and recreations gives a long list of prevalent games and sports including games on boards with 8 or 10 rows visualized board games hopscotch dice sticks painting shapes with the hand ball games blowing pipes playing with toy plows turning somersaults and different kinds of wheel mills made of leaves and many other pleasures 
toy cards, toy bows, guessing at letters, etc. So therefore, Buddha knew that these were in practice and to attain Buddhahood, you have to refrain from that. Now, one of the major activity of uh, in the arena of games were dicing. It was one of the most popular pastimes for people from all classes. The dices were made of gilded shells, wooden or ivory cubes or of the nut of the bibhitaka fruit. It is a fruit which was the size of a hazelnut and had five facets. It is interesting to note that the game of dice was prevalent in India as early as in the Harappan period. And initially, the game of dice was linked to Rajashiva sacrifice. It was in fact an integral part of this Rajashiva sacrifice. So if we go through the, the kind of things that one had to perform in the Rajashiva sacrifice, dicing becomes very important. There were two different types of dicing games in ancient texts. One was Bibhitaka and the other was Pashaka and which had Pashaka was generally played with three oblong dice with four sides. This is an example of the game of dice from which was recovered from the Indus Valley. You can see the square board and the pawns there. Another kind of board game which was played by dice was the Chaturanga. Board games like chess or four crops was also very famous. It was known in the text as Ashtopado. It needed a board, two dices and the gamesmen and was played by four players. It was played on specially designed boards or on a table whose surface had been inlaid with precious substances representing the requisite pattern. Choturango probably developed as a royal game to aid the kings in military strategizing. And it became a very popular game by the end of the first millennium CE. Here you can see that how a Chaturanga board looked like. Now, dicing was, as you know, was an important part of royalty, royal games. And we have seen how in the Mahabharata, dicing actually played a very important role. Now, apart from dicing and chaturanga, there were other forms of pastimes for the common people. These two were the pastimes from the loyal elites. So we have in sculptures, particularly from Sachi, Bodhgaya, Bharut and from many other places where we find that wrestling was the game of the common man. Wrestling, acrobatics, hunting, etc. were everyday pastimes. And this is from a picture from medieval Karnataka. So you have this kind of representations of wrestling in many sculptures right from the early times to the medieval period. Now for the women, there were also different kinds of games. And this we know specifically from the texts. For example, we had in ancient India ball games by women. In Kalidasha's Kumara Sambhavam, we find that Parvati, the main protagonist, was quite fond of ball games. Again, in Raghuvamsha, Kalidasa writes that the Naga princess Kumudavati played the ball game. In the post Kalidasa period, we have Dandins, Jashakumara Charita, where we have an arresting description of the ball game played in a festival called Kanduka in the city of Damalipta. 
Damalipt is Tamrolipt in present day Tamluk in Bengal and it was played by the princess of the Shumha country her name was princess Kandukavati This kind of ball games were actually played like the ball used to be thrown upwards and then the princess would catch the ball from the air and again throw them to the, on the, to the up so this needed a lot of skill therefore in dashakumara charita kandugavati used to perform this in the presence of many people during festivals and was praised a lot swinging was also another pastime for the women folk particularly we have beautiful description of women singing swinging and that it was a great attraction in the pavana duta of dhoi it is said in dhoi's pavana duta that beautiful young women love to sway to and fro seated on swings in the garden dhoi writes that gardening or planting and watering betel nut that is kramoka and the bees and the plants in household courtyards and gardens was a favorite pastime of women folk in bengal therefore the women used to pa, uh, used to stay a long time outdoors either in the garden or in the uh, planting in planting trees now there is also description of popular sports in early indian texts here we find that in the arena of popular games we have reference to animal figure fights the favorite animals to be pitted against each other were the quail which is lavaka in sanskrit the cock kukkuta and the ram mesha then we have buffalo mahisha elephant gaja and in the text it is said that these were all vinoda that is entertainment therefore one can understand that as a popular game these kind of fights of animals and birds attained much popularity in early indian scenario even we have reference to bull fight which was particularly restricted to south india but this bull fight was not like the spanish bull fight of you all know an early tamil poem according to m basham al basham gives a vivid description it says that this kind of bull fight was a test for of manhood uh, manhood for uh, and the sport of great danger basham actually gives a description that how the bulls were caught and how the man young man went and uh, confronted the bull but in this case the bull was not killed in early india there were also other kind of popular entertainments and those we learn from the jatakas as you know the jatakas were stories which gives us a lot of information about popular life so therefore here we find that jataka referred to various other modes of popular entertainment such as magic half body dancing sword swallowing monkey and mongoose handling snake charming acrobatics dancing rope dancing and pole dancing actually if we look at the sculptures of different monastic sites the we the terracotta sculptures this give us a lot of images of the popular life where we have images of acrobats doing acrobatics in these panels of the monasteries now we all know of choshatti kala that is the 64 arts that a courtesan has to be practiced upon so among the 64 arts to be learned by a courtesan 
some games and sports however have been included so there were kind of games and sports it was not only fun and other leisure kind of things but games and sports were also included namely for prahelika which is composing and solving riddles and rhymes so that this was not outdoor games but a kind of games where you needed to use your mind and of course your brain then pratimalo which is a game in which one party recites a verse and the opposite party recites another which begins from the same letter which the last verse ended with so these kind of games were an exercise for the devadasis for uh, the exercise for the ganikas and therefore the ganikas had to be quite expert in learning all these things then we have durvacha chakra yoga which is tongue twisters which we all enjoy even today then we have kavya samasya puranana that is filling out incomplete verse riddles then mesha kukkuta kuk kukkuta labhaka yuddha that is yuddha viram that is cock fighting as i mentioned earlier there were cock fighting ram fighting quail fighting quail is lavaka mesha is ram and kukkuta is cock then we have duta vishesha duta krida which is gambling and we first started with the th- with the idea that dicing was a very important kind of pastime so here we also see that even the courtesans the ganikas had to learn the game of dice because in order to entertain a nagaraka he she had to be well versed with the game of dice then we have akarshaka krida which is also a game of dice then vyayama krida which is physical exercise and there are many more but these kind of games or pastime sports which are there in the text shows that how a ganika has to be conversed or well versed in this exercises now from the ganika if we move to a nagaraka the life of a nagaraka which has been described by vatsayana in his kama sutra it's a beautiful description and there too we find that sports pastimes formed a part of his life so vatsayana describes the outer bedroom of a nagaraka and the text says that in, i quote vatsayana in the in the outer bedroom there's a bed low in the middle and very soft with pillows on both sides and a white top sheet there's also a couch at the head of the bed there's a grass mat and an altar on which are placed the oils and garlands left over from the night a pot of beeswax a vial of perfume some bark from a lemon tree and betel which is important is that a lute hanging from an ivory tusk a board to draw a paint on on and a board of dice and a board for gambling is also there in the outer room so this is an idea of a marked space for each activities which was associated with games and music so a nagaraka's life was also concentrated was also important for games and a uh, sports next comes music which is also an important pastime or entertainment for the early people the history of indian music can be traced back to the samaveda but by the gupta period music particularly the ability to play the lute became a status symbol we have the famous coin of samudragupta where he is playing a lyre so 
and if we read the qualifications of the rulers given in the inscription, we see that they were all very proficient in music and different kinds of instruments. Therefore, since having a lute became a status symbol, so we find that the outer bedchamber of the Nagaraka would have a lute which I just discussed. Now, apart from the textual evidences, there are plaques where we have, which are narrative plaques, which invoke time and again an important social group comprising the musicians. Right from the time of 2nd century BC, for example, in Chandrakatugar in Bengal, we have different sculptures where we find that musicians were represented and from other early historic sites also even to the early medieval monastic sites musician with their musical instruments are distinctly visible either represented as a part of a group or on occasions or individually they include dramas both male and female players flute players and dancers. So here there are two examples. This is a female drama from Chandrakatagar and a dancer. You can see in a plaque, terracotta plaque, a dancer is represented. This is also an example of a musical performance. A couple is performing and you can see the lyre in the head, hand of the male. Now from games, pastimes, we move to festivals. Festivals, as I mentioned in the beginning, that these were all, most of the festivals had fixed dates. So we knew no when and when the festival has to occur. And these were occasions of community celebrations. They were a kind of community gatherings which were called samajas in early Indian texts and inscriptions. The earliest text mentioning the samajas is the Dighanikaya, which views a samaja as a festival comprising dance, singing, music, storytelling, symbols and tamtams. Buddha actually did not prescribe or was not very favorable to this such kind of samajas. And later on, in Ashokan inscriptions, we find that Ashoka was against samajas. But on the, uh, on the other hand, we have Kharavela, who was the ruler of Kalinga in the post mauryan period. He mentions the presence of samajas where dance, music and revelry formed the part. Samajas, according to Ashoka, was a place where people would congregate, talk all kinds of unworthy words, and so it was not practicable to have a Samaja. But that the Samajas were well prevalent in the first century CE is also evident from Ashagosha's Sondarananda Kavya. So these were a very important part of everyday life. Regarding this, from these festivals, the Samajas actually gradually turned into different kinds of, we have different kinds of community gathering and the festivals came up. So there were both rural and urban festivals. For the rural, we find that the peasants followed the rhythm of the seasons with their associated festivals, particularly it was linked with the harvesting. Festivals were also the chief sources of livelihood for the professional entertainers, amusers and sportsmen of which we just mentioned like the Nottos, the Nartakis, the Bhanas, so the acrobats. They were actually performing in lieu of money in the different festivals. So it was a source of livelihood for them. A strong support for festivals with singing and dancing comes in the 
man mouth of krishna in the bhagavata purana krishna talks about the importance of festival and that it should have a lot of fun and frolicking the kama sutra mentions different types of gatherings supposed to be attended by the householders this include seasonal festival events and drinking parties then witism and other things in different texts we have description of cities and when we have description of cities then obviously the different kinds of sports the festivals that were a part and parcel of that city would come up so i'm giving you an example of a city which you all know this is pataliputra now in the ubhavisharika it is said of pataliputra that due to people's lack of any fear their constant participation with happy faces in festivals the graceful wearing of jewels and the gorgeous decoration of the body with garlands scents and fine clothes their competence in various diverting sports and for their well other well known qualities the earth with pataliputra as a tilaka appears like heaven unquote so therefore why pataliputra is like a heaven because it has its share of festivals and fun next i am talking about vasanta sutava which is the spring festival now spring festival or vasanta utsava was the most important festival of early india and several names are found for spring festivals such as vasanta utsava which was common then holaka falguna utsava phaggu chaitra utsava madana mahotsava kamotsava etc now there is a view that holi and madana utsava was perhaps the same but it is now studied that holi was a festival which was different from madana utsava madana utsava was the worship of madana the god of love which took place in the month of chaitra and it was possibly a 3 4 day festival starting on the 12th day of the bright fourth night of chaitra and continuing till the full moon the festival was also called chaitra utsava its main objective was the worship of madana the god of love by the people uh, so that they would be a uh, having lot of fun and frolics frolicking and love was on the air during the time of vadana utsava now for the rural population there was the harvesting festival and from this plug this is broken but you can see that it's a procession actually led by musicians a bejeweled elephant follows the musicians who are playing on the drum and a long flute in the background two men are seen carrying the harvested crop their seasonal event is being represented which marks the grandeur and the importance of harvest festival in a rural milieu another festival which was known very famous in india was the kaumudi mahotsava the kaumudi mahotsava was a festival performed with great excitement houses and shops being decorated with flags and flowers and illuminated at night men and women rejoiced in singing and dancing a great feast of meat ended it so there was lot of food gatherings and enjoyment the jataka mala of arya sura describes 
talks about these festivals and it describes how the streets and squares were sprinkled and cleansed, ground strewn with many colored flowers for the festival. Then there were banners, flags all around. So it was very decorated. Throughout the city was decorated. There was dancing, singing. The occasion was celebrated on the full moon day of Kartika. So festivals were arenas where there was full of fun and laughter. The third very important festival was the Indra Mahatshava, which is the festival of Indra. And it was present throughout in the early Indian history. We have many sources which talk about this. It was celebrated in August, September and October. And here what is important is that the presence of the king is mandatory. This festival was brilliant and impressive in the capital itself since the king was present there. It was a kind of a yashti, so the standard was a tree carefully chosen from the surrounding forests. It was carried with great ceremony to the gaily bedecked town where it was set up in the main square. It was then adorned with white banners, small bells, garlands, strings of bright trinkets and clusters of fruit of different kinds. So this yashti was decorated very nicely for this festival. There was the crowd sound of drum bits and the loud welcoming cries of the crowd. And finally, it was kept tightly upright by ropes. On a full moon day, the stuff was finally lowered and carried to the river where the current was allowed to sweep it away. So one standard that is the yashti was being worshipped and all the fun were surrounded by were surrounded surrounding this yashti. Now I'll be talking about a festival which you all enjoy and that is the Dipavali festival which is the festival of lights. During October and November it was the autumn festival or the feast of lamps. Moreover, the practice of illumination has immense significance for the Jainas as well because Dipavali was celebrated by all kinds, all communities. But in case of the Jainas, it was significant as we find that Bhadrabahu's Kalpa Sutra writes that Mahavira passed away on this day and the Mallas and the Vrijis lit lamps in his honor. So therefore, it had a special significance for the Jainas. The Padma Purana, which is a later Purana, says that the illuminations in all the houses in the evening of the 14th day was always there. Next day, the king entertained the citizens in a large reception with bullfighters, actors, dancers, etc. And the Pavali nights were always a night for gambling. Lot of money laundering was there in early India and even now. At midnight, women cast out a Lakshmi to the sound of drums and music. In Bengal, there is a puja where you have the casting out of Alakshmi and bringing in Lakshmi during the time of Dipavali. The popularity of the festival was noted none other than Albiruni, who describes how everybody wore new clothes, took betel nuts, leaves, Erika Nats went to the temples to worship Lakshmi and lit lamps in the evening. In Gujarat also it has a very important significance and the new year actually starts the next day of the Pavali. The Yashastilaka Champu indicates the importance of the festival to the trading classes. 
Excitement was created by gambling as I mentioned that it was a night of gambling and it was a chance of money making. The, this festival lasted sometimes for the three whole days. On the first day, people bathed, purified themselves ritually and offered a libation in honor of the king of the dead, while temples and public places were illuminated. On the second day, a carnival was organized with music, dancing and games of chance. It is said that at midnight in the capital, the king emerged without any es escort and mixed freely with the people. This was very significant but because rarely do we see this. And on the third day, the prostitutes, that is the ganikas, went from house to house wishing good luck to the people. Sweets were also distributed and presents were also distributed by the king. Therefore, Dipavali was a very important festival in the life of the people. Now, what we have discussed just now shows that our sources give a vivid description of the amusements and festivals that were a part of the urban and rural life of early India. What did we learn? We learned that dicing was the most common game for the urban elites. Even we all know about Mahabharata and the game of dice. Even in the story of Nala, we have references how he lost everything in the game of dice. Popular sports like wrestling, archery and acrobatics also attracted the common folk. Festivals were actually regular affairs and there were specific timings for each festival. Komadi Mahatshava, Dipavali, Falgunotshava, Chaitrotshava, all of which was possibly seasonal agrarian festivals gradually evolved as organized urban festivals. So we can see that there was a shift. Agrarian festivals remained to be performed, remained to be enjoyed in the villages. But when coming into the urban milieu, it changed some of its character and became much more vibrant in the cities. Vasantasova, which was the most important of the festivals, seems to be a generic term signifying both the spring festivals as the term is used as a synonym to both in the Kama Sutra, that is both for Madanotshava and also for Holi, the festival of colors. Fertility rites like offering mango bud to Madana or giving the mango tree into marriage with a Madhavi creeper were also practiced. And this we have different kinds of texts like Parijata Manjari, which talks about such kind of events. While the king participates in the festival of light, the king who played an important part in organizing the Vashantotsava himself stood away from direct participation. Visuals, literature, epigraphy and archaeological remains provide a glimpse into this world of the people. Thus, if you have to know about the festivals, you can read the different kinds of Sanskrit literature where you will find a vivid description of these festivals. And for further reading, you go to EPG Patshala and you will have much more information on that. Thank you.